Hello and welcome to the St. Andrews Society of Los Angeles podcast. Each episode will bring you the latest news from the St. Andrews Society of Los Angeles, as well as fascinating interviews with entertainment personalities, government leaders, and community advocates. St. Andrews Society of Los Angeles, where Scotland meets the City of Angels. Let's get started. Our guest today is Kate Dickey. Kate Dickey is an esteemed Scottish actress who has appeared in several films, television, and plays. She is known for her work in Prometheus, Game of Thrones, The Witch, Couple in a Hole, Star Wars The Last Jedi, the recently released film The Northman, and many others, including Red Road, which garnered Kate her first of many Best Actress BAFTA awards. You can see Kate in the upcoming films Raven's Hollow and Worm Eater. Our guest moderator today is Gavin Lang. Gavin is a filmmaker from Scotland and a recipient of the BAFTA Rockcliffe Writing Award last year. He is currently a staff writer for Paramount. Please welcome both Kate Decky and Gavin Lang. Thanks so much for taking the time out to talk with us today. I know we've got some great questions and I am really excited to see what comes of our conversation. Uh, I'm really looking forward to having a pleasure with you today and, and thank you so much for having me on. It's, it's a pleasure. Kate, thank you uh, so much for joining us. Um, you've had you know, an incredible career with such a broad range of roles. Um, I'm always amazed by sort of the depth you bring to all of your characters. Um, I'd love to know a little bit more about sort of your journey and the differences in working on smaller independent Scottish films and then those big massive American blockbusters. Yeah I mean it's it's been a, a quite an interesting journey actually because most of my stuff is smaller independent um, films and I, I'm quite comfortable in those in those kind of dimensions now because I'm used to them and and I'm getting more comfortable with bigger things but I, I, and I've talked about this before in, in other interviews but when I did like um, Prometheus back in 2011 I think it was I'd only been doing films for a few years at that point and then um, there'd been small budget and I just got so overwhelmed by the kind of scale of everything, the, the like everyone being at the top of their game, you know, every department is amazing. Every, you know, all the actors were, were such brilliant actors. You had Ridley, we had, yeah, the departments were incredible. And I, I spent the first month kind of on the edge of a panic attack, really, because I just felt really overwhelmed by everything. And I also had a bit of imposter syndrome as well. And I just thought, you know, like having been a kind of lifetime fan of Ridley and, you know, and, and admired, you know, a lot of the actors that I was working with and and the films, it, it just was huge. And I spent the kind of first month, you know, just shaking in my boots. And then, oh, t you know, the whole cast were just gorgeous, beautiful people. And it was quite a small, tight-knit group. And Wrigley was the kindest. And all the heads of the department and all the crew were lovely. And once I settled in, I was just like, but it's just, it is just the same, but just in a much bigger scale. And then, um, but your job is actually exactly the same. Your job is to turn up, give your character the best voice you can give them, tell your story to the best of your ability, and, and just kind of do your job. And once I'd kind of got my head around that, it, it just kind of grounded me a bit. And I just thought, actually, you know, this, this, imposter syndrome and the nervousness is holding me back from do, doing my job which is what I'm employed to do so that really helped me and that's what helps me when I do do bigger budget um, things is just always rem reminding myself that my job's the same turn up in time know my lines be willing to collaborate be willing to really push myself for my character and and tell and tell their story as best I can um so now 
it feels like, you know, it's just about concentrating on those kind of things and not getting too overwhelmed by, you know, worrying about, you know, got the budgets or not worrying, but, you know, being aware of, you know, just how much money and time and people and and things like that and just concentrate really on what, what, what you need to concentrate on. So, um, yeah, I tend to play smaller roles in bigger budget things, so that will change the way I approach a character as well. You know, if you're playing... Um, if you've got more of a story to tell, then, you know, your approach to a part or your your kind of preparation, for me anyway, can be, differ a bit as well. So that's the kind of differences I, I find now. When you strip away those differences between the independent and the, and the much bigger projects, and you're just, when it comes to your process, um, it sounds like it's sort of very similar when you, again, when you sort of stop thinking about the scale of it and you're just focused on you and your character. Yeah. Um, I'm curious when you're sort of in those early stages, what is it that informs um, how you sort of develop the the role in, in your head? Is it, you know, I know you trained at the Royal Conservatory of Scotland. Um, obviously yeah. you spend time with the script and with the director. Um, what is it that sort of you do to sort of get yourself ready? Yeah, that's a really good question, actually. I did get a lot of skills at the the conservatoire and you get fantastic skills with voice work, especially, you know, and breathing techniques and all different acting. But for film acting, for me anyway, it's quite a different beast. And um, I've kind of learned on the job, really. I didn't have any film training or or anything like that. And I've learned by making a lot of clunky mistakes along the way and, and having to go, oh, OK, that doesn't work in film or that was too much or, I, you know, whatever. Um, and my process is... Um, yeah, it is pretty similar. I start off with a lot of questions. So I'll go through a script and and just write out, I mean, whatever questions come to mind, they can be really deep questions or they can literally be like what my favourite colour is or, you know, what the character's favourite colour is. And then I just keep reading through and it's a strange thing. You get feelings about characters and certain feelings so I just keep going through with the questions and then I start answering some of them in my head or looking at the script and it's a kind of process of elimination in a way for me as well um sometimes you can start off with so many ideas and then as you go on it's about whittling a lot of that away a lot of the window dressing isn't really necessary and gets the purity it's sort of hard to explain but it comes in feelings I do quite a lot of prep on my own because um if you're working in the say on an independent film anyway you don't have a lot of luxury of time with the director and prep time on set and you know you're, you're you're at home and then maybe if you're lucky you'll get you know obviously you'll get chats with the director but sometimes you turn up with your character and you just have to then do the collaborating on set um so I try and do as much prep as I can on my own and like just the feel of the character how she carries herself you know all her background I write out backgrounds um they don't necessarily get seen by anyone but me and they're not necessarily right or a lot of it maybe isn't right but I just try and create baggage basically um, I think it's important to walk on into a scene with baggage of a life, you know, you're not a fresh person that's just been born on that page. You, you know, I think, well, who was this character five years ago? Or what's she going to be like in, say, five years? You know, you try and build this kind of life. Um, and I use also, I make playlists, music playlists. So I'll have a playlist of music that only my character listens to. And uh, sometimes that, well, not sometimes, it's always fun, um, especially when they've got really bad taste in music or listen to like really like naff stuff or I don't know. I really enjoy making playlists for my characters um, because and then what I'll do nearer the time is I try and just listen to their playlists and stuff like that. And then I have another playlist, which is a mood playlist, I guess I'd call it. And that's um, different moods I'll have for different scenes. And that tends to be more down the line of classical music. 
Um, I use a lot of, um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing them right, but there's an Estonian composer called Arvo Part or Arvo Pert. And I use a lot of his music. I use um, some Michael Nyman, some, um, oh, there's a great uh, Icelandic composer called Olafur Arnalds. And so I just listened to loads of music. And then, so that came out of being on the side of set and yapping with, you know, the, you know, the crew and blah, blah, blah. And then I was suddenly supposed to be on set doing like, you know, really heavy. A lot of my stuff's very heavy and dark. And I was just like, how do I compromise the chatty, friendly Kate with the Kate who needs to be on the ball and in her character and that. And so that's when I started using like headphones and I thought, well, if I pop my headphones on and listen to music, it means the crew know when they, because it's hard for the crew sometimes, they don't know if they, you know, you're in the moment or you're not and if they can approach you to ask about a bit of costume or do a check or not. So I started putting on my headphones and saying, oh, if I've got my headphones on, that means I'm in the moment or something. And then through that, I started listen to music and then I was like oh this could help me actually get into character so this has been going on for about 10 years these playlists um and then I also use uh photography and paintings a lot visuals uh, I'm on Instagram a lot and it's not about looking for the character and going that's them I want it's 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 life on people's faces it's character or I'll sit in the park very creepily and I watch people watch all the time and what interests me is like the way people carry themselves just walking along like do they walk along and are they walking along like at life a bit I don't know a lot of people have got one side higher than the other I mean there's so many things and it's not again about looking for caricatures I just am so fascinated by human behavior and human stories and there's a lot of little sort of uh, inroads into characters, even and how they carry themselves physically and stuff. So quite a long rambling answer, I know, but there's quite a lot of different bits of prep. And then I kind of have lots of chats with the director and I, I am that person that's always tugging on the sleeve with questions, you know, lots of questions um, and just, you know, hopeful for a good rapport and a good um, communication with your director, writer, uh, co-stars, just so you can collaborate with each other as, as much as possible. Because also the other layer is it's not just about you. And it's not just about your character's journey and what the story that you need to tell you to tell that in the context of everyone, everyone's stories and stuff. So I'm a real believer in collaboration and it being a, you know as much of a kind of team effort as possible. And and, my, and I tend to disappear nearer and nearer. If I'm doing a, 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 a meaty, deep, heavy role, I can find Kate just slowly disappearing because I just get taken over by thoughts, thinking about character and thinking about what would she do, you know, and I can find myself just disappearing, dis disconnecting with myself nearer and nearer. So, yeah, it's a really interesting process, actually. As you're talking about this, I'm like, I want to see all the playlists. I want a copy of every single playlist from every character. And I know. And some, I should have kept them over the years. And then sometimes I've just delete, you know, I've got this thing where I say goodbye to my characters and I pack them away and I grieve them and there's a process. And I have got some in my iPhone, but I thought, oh, I really wish I'd kept like a book with all my playlists and all the, so I must start that actually, because it's never too late. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I did some cats I've been into some really, you know, I mean, I love country and western, but you know, some really wild stuff. And then oh. if you're playing... If you're playing a character who's historical, that's more difficult. I don't try and find you know, what they would maybe, you know, I, I just try and go for the mood pieces more than um, I think. I mean, I'll maybe find some bits and bobs, but it's harder <laughs> if you're not doing contemporary to find, you know, music that they'd listen to. Yeah. Well, I'm signing up for your playlist. Uh, <laughs> I'm there. Same here. I'm there. I am 100% in on <laughs> it. An idea, actually. Never say never. <laughs> 
I'm going to wait for the coffee table book to come out. It's just like Kate's playlist. It'll be a picture of your character and then her play and then the playlist. Next so, to it. I should I'm just there. do that for myself though. I should definitely do that for myself because it would just be a fun thing to look back on. And, yeah. And, and, oh, and, yeah. And, yeah, I should. It's a funny thing. I kind of, some actors keep bits of their costume and want to keep bits of their character, but I tend to say goodbye to them. You know, mm. the odd time I've come home with some if I'm gifted something, but I don't tend to ask for bits of my costume or a wee bit of my, I tend to just sort of say cheerio so yeah we're all different we're all different beasts and that's yeah. the interesting thing every actor has got you know other actors are like what are you talking about playlists and this and that you know <laughs> be in the moment be present and I admire that so much yeah. but I'm someone who has to build baggage and in, in, in order to feel very um completely abs- absorbed into the into the moment you know um so that's just the way I do it that that is awesome like I said I I'm 100% for it I would love to see some of these playlists I, I wonder if when you had watched some of your previous films you're like oh yeah she was listening to that song and- <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh, that's 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 yeah <laughs> Yeah, and the problem is, if I hear any of those pieces of classical <laughs> music, though, that have helped me, I mean, some are like, boom, I mean, really, like, big. They can, I can just sometimes be in floods of tears like that, you know, and, oh, wow. you know, wow. whatever, because I've used that piece of music so much. Like, I use this, uh, it's an interesting story, actually. I, well, I say this, you might not find it, but I did this film called Couple in a Hole, and it is about a couple living in a hole in the ground in France. And it's a, one of the saddest, saddest characters I've ever, ever played. And she's completely frozen with grief. And, oh, it's, it's, it's hard to explain, but it's, a hard, it's, it's not a hard watch, but she's so sad. And um, I hunted for oh so long to, to find her kind of theme music that I wanted, to, a piece of music that I could just play that just got me straight into her. And I ended up picking Roads by Portishead, that beautiful, wow. haunting, and it was just perfect for Karen. So I spent the whole, I mean, I literally, when I get into songs, I'm taught I can listen to that one song for weeks on a loop, like all day, every day, it goes on and on and on. So this had been the only thing going every day, all the time. And then we got to the edit, and not we, I wasn't editing, but the director um, started editing, and he, he called me up and he said, oh, we got, um, I'll tell you who we've got for, to do this the, the score. And I said, oh, who? And he said, a band called Beak. And I said, oh, I don't know him. He said, oh, they're, uh, Jeff Barrow from Beak was, was in Portishead. And I was like... <gasps> No, no, and I was like, "You've got to be kidding me!" Like I have been using roads for months. It's like my theme, and now Jeff Barrow from Portishead is beak, and they're doing the score. So it was just, it was just this beautiful piece of serendipity for me because I had went through thousands of contemporary and classical pieces of music for Karen. And um, that one, you know, eventually I was like, this is it, this is it. And and then, oh, I just love things like that. It was like it was meant to be. I've got a question. Um, in The Witch and in Game of Thrones, you seem to take on like great ferocity while displaying a great deal of vulnerability. And in Red Road, you were able to show strong emotion with subtle looks and gestures where so much was happening beneath the surface. Um, with the diversity of great performances, are there characters or roles you'd like to play and experience as an actor? And is there a specific genre that you want to jump into? Like, are we going to see Kate doing a super action movie? Anytime? <laughs> uh, Old Kate. <laughs> uh, maybe young, I, when young Kate did a play called Running Girl where I ran 10 kilometers a night in this play in a treadmill. Kate, now I don't know about the, the being able to be a, a super badass uh, hero. I mean, I don't have I like. I see it. I see it. <laughs> oh, I like that you see it. You maybe seen something in me that I've not seen yet. Um, and I'm obviously, I, I'm actually pretty adventurous, so I would be up for it. Um, see, I've just got this 
it, my passion lies with stories and it's not like I've got a specific story or it has to be a genre. I think my genre, my happy genre is what we used to call kitchen sink drama, you know, the you know, the real gritty uh, working class or, you know, people's stories. I just, I'm very much interested in the stories that other people maybe don't really want to tell or maybe are uncomfortable with or find difficult. Um, I bang on about this a lot, but I think as, as a human beings, we just all deserve to be able to look at something once in our life and go, that's me, that's me up in the screen. Not necessarily my story, but I get that. That's my life experience. That's, you know, everything. We all deserve that. For me, it's just, yeah, I don't have like a role that I've always went, oh, I'd love to play that. It's just telling these stories as, with as much truthfulness as possible really um so I tend to be interested in the dark the dark stuff um the uncomfortable stuff the really grim I guess it would be for other people but there's lots of amazing life in these stories I think there's plenty I, I like watching fluff and you know I enjoy like comedy and I love watching all different genres but the stories I want to tell are the ones that maybe are in the peripheries. I guess that's the word, the ones that are maybe not out there or well-known or people, yeah, people don't want to talk about. I'd love to ask more about where you think that that instinct comes from, um, you know, your, your, your passion to tell stories and to tell these sort of, you know, stories that are lesser told. Yeah, I mean, I've had quite a life. <laughs> and um, I guess, you know, there's stories of mine that I maybe wished I could have seen when I was younger, you know, and feeling quite alone with stuff. And I think if I'd been able to see or, or feel like I wasn't alone with certain things, it maybe would have helped me. And also, I, I moved around quite a lot as a youngster and things as well, and it creates quite a disconnect. You know, you make friends, you settle down. It's not like we're moving every year, but kind of every four years through my kind of from childhood to teens, we moved. And, you know, in the 80s, it was quite feral <laughs> being new girl. And I had a name like Dickie, you know, which, you know, even that word, it, you know, it just encouraged a lot of uh, uh, teasing, bullying. And I just ended up developing quite a big mouth. You know, I was able to sort of mask a lot of my insecurities and, and fears. And if you met me, I, I appear very gregarious, very confident. I'm actually really shy and uh, yeah so I guess it's to do with maybe the disconnect and some of the loneliness with some issues I had when I was younger and just maybe wishing that I'd seen more of that you know I, I don't know I have, I have a lot of empathy there's a lot of stuff going on in life that you know some people aren't even aware of you know have no knowledge of aren't aware of and there's also just stories that people just need to be told so they can go, I am not alone or I'm not this freak or I'm not, you know, I just think we all deserve to feel part of something, included in something. Um, I just have a very big desire for that. It's fascinating that you connect that with your upbringing as well, because I think uh, for a lot of actors, it's very hard to understand exactly what informs uh, their desire to tell stories and it's really interesting yeah. that you have that level of self-reflection when you're sort of uh, yeah I mean I, I get asked that a lot and I guess I've had to reflect over the years and I guess if the first time I got asked that I was like probably like I just loved acting or something but I think as you get older and you start to look back in your life or you look at yourself more or you're more self-aware, you start to see, all right, actually, there, of course, there's always, I mean, this is what I love as an actor, doing a character. There's always reasons for behaviour, even if that behaviour is terrible. 
Um, I mean, there's certain things I wouldn't obviously advocate or, 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 you know, champion in this world. But I'm talking about your general humans trying to deal with life kind of stuff. You know, I'm always fascinated if I meet someone who's really prickly or actually not very nice or unfriendly or whatever. Because I just, in me, I always think, what's happened to make that? why that's your armour why do you wear this armour and then you want to find a way of letting that person know that they don't need that armour with you that you're safe a safe space and you know (laughs) and I suppose that kind of leads me into my next question which is about uh how you choose the roles that you're going to play you know um you've clearly you've been in very high demand you know the the past couple years the entertainment industry hasn't been you know at the same level that it has been but it feels like you've you know your credits list keeps on growing in that time (laughs) and so obviously you know a lot of people are, are are reaching out to you about different characters what is it about those characters is it that you sort of read the scripts and you look under that armor and find the truth and if that appeals to you then that's a role you want to take or is there something else that that sort of excites you yeah it it tends to be the writing for me the story um the character if there's if there's a you know it doesn't have to be you know a big part or a lead or anything like that but if you've got enough meat to be able to tell a story that isn't too dimensional and you, it, it, it's like a kind of, you just sometimes connect with something and sometimes you just go, this isn't for me. I don't feel a connection with this. And I always try and not take on roles that I don't feel a connection with because that role deserves to be told by someone who has a connection with them, you know, and I don't want to be just being like, oh, I just I just have to work. I just have to work all the time. And you do feel like that. Well, I do as a, a working class, a self-employed actor. I can never get rid of the worry that I'll never work again, that this could be the last job, that I might not work for five, ten, you know, you, you never know. And I've had periods, and and it, I think it looks like I'm busier than I am sometimes because I pop up in things, but that might just be a few days' work or a couple of weeks, and you know, um, which is I'm so blessed and so grateful for all the work I've had. I've had such a lucky break and amazing people I've worked with, but I've always got a fear that I won't work again. And I think that's just across the board, not even just with actors. I'm imagining with any person that's self-employed, it's a scary, it's a scary world to be in um, when you don't have all the, you know, kind of safety nets. Anyway, I've digressed. So the roles I choose, yeah. So I try and always, it has to be something I connect with. Um, and again, I think it goes back to what I'm saying. It's just stories that I, I, I want to tell um, or people that are maybe kind of scratchy or a bit odd. And I don't mean odd and a, a disrespectful or, or um, throw away me. I just mean you can't quite get your finger on what they're about. And I think, oh, that could be really interesting to explore or I just want to tell their story. or And then other times it can be, the director or the writer you know you just have such a great connection or there's some, you know the way they, they pitch the pitch the story to you go I'm not quite seeing it yet but I really like your ideas and I'm going to take a leap of faith because I think there's something you know so there's a few different things for me but I think the main thing would be the the, the story and the, and the character and then um, and I've been very lucky to work with director writers as well like Andrea Arnold's a director writer um for those in peril um Paul who I worked with he wrote it and directed it and that, that's when you feel really spoiled because all the questions that I'm there you know tugging at their sleeve with even if they don't have the answers it's come from within them so uh, for me I feel in really safe hands then because I just think, oh, this has come from you. So even if you don't have the answer, if you're happy with the way I'm playing it, it means you know we're on we're on a kind of the same page. So um, that could be exciting. I find that exciting at working with writer directors as well. 
So you've been nominated and won many awards for your performances. Is there a particular role that was like the turning point where you realized, okay, I finally arrived? <laughs> right. Okay. So I have never got to that point. Okay. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no. Oh, that makes me laugh. So that, that I can't. I can't ever imagine reaching a point where I go. I've made it. I just can. I. I. I can. I think I'm constantly looking. What always thinking I could be better. Always kind of striving. I mean, there's maybe. I mean, there's been a few turning points, but Red Road was my first film. I'd never done a film before Red Road. I'd done 15 years of theatre, or maybe 12, 13 years of theatre. I'd done a t- bits of TV, and I'd done a couple of short films. So Red Road catapulted me into, and I don't mean catapulted me as in here I am. I mean, you know, my head was suddenly in the film industry, and I didn't know anything about this industry at all and oh what a, a a beautiful joyous amazing experience to have with Andrea Arnold as my first feature film I mean I cannot praise her enough she's incredible in every sense possible as a person as a director as a writer as a visionary as a filmmaker, I just think she's amazing. So I was like really spoiled, having no idea I was really spoiled and had no idea that lead roles for women weren't really a thing. I mean, obviously they are for certain people and in certain bits, but I just, I I just didn't know the disparity. I, I just was a bit clueless. So I was like, oh, wow, you know, playing this fantastic character in this great film. And it's only once you're in the industry for a while, you go, wow, that actually was really unusual, you know, amazing. My first film to be directed by a woman, um, you know, and she wrote it. I played the lead. I was in every scene. The story was amazing. It was interesting. I wasn't supporting the man's story. I wasn't, you know, and um, yeah, for me, that was, a, a, it's been a massive, massive part of my life. I've never, I can't ever imagine getting to a point where I go, I've, I've made it. You know, I think, I don't know what that means. I've made it really, you know, to me, I'm like, if I could keep working and telling stories and, and you know, getting the chance to, be characters that are interesting and, and meaty, then that's that's amazing for me. You know, it's uh, I'm really happy, really happy with that. Great to hear that the the, um, the pursuit of storytelling is just kind of what is keeping you going. And and you know, yeah. because I think uh, I mean, I just have to note, you know, you won a Scottish BAFTA for Red Road, and it was your first film you know it's that's an incredible achievement and uh, and I know you're saying there was no moment where you thought I've made it but you know that is such an incredible uh I mean if that was the start of your career you know uh, well, well I, th- I mean the thing is I and I honestly don't really feel I could take much credit for it because Andrea <laughs> had such a big but she did though she had such a big part in guiding me and awards and things that they're so lovely to get but also I'm like I know so many amazing actors that deserve awards and recognition and all this so it's a strange old thing isn't it <laughs> but I think it's a test it's great for the film it's great for the film mm-hmm. because it gives the film you know like more light on it and and more audiences and things like that so I'm not a fan of pub- I, I don't do a lot of self-publicity and uh, interviews and stuff like that but I will if it's to promote films and things because, you know, they, especially if you're doing low budget independent movies, there's no budget or very little budget for promotion. So, you, you know, you want to give a helping hand. And now I'd love to sort of take a step back from um, sort of specifics of, of working on projects and talk more about the Scottish industry. Um, you know, Scotland's diaspora around the world is, sort of, you know, many times outnumbers the actual population of Scotland. There are many people of Scottish heritage all around the world. Um, is there anything you would want them uh, to see from them when it comes to supporting, you know, Scotland's sort of uh, very talented entertainment industry? 
Um, I think it's just more about seeking out, especially the the like really seeking out the low budget indies. You know, the little films are making here. You know, um, not in a lot of money. Maybe not the most well known, or maybe nobody's known. Um, but some amazing filmmakers are are you know in Scotland and amazing talent across the board. Choose the lot, and um, yeah, it's just maybe just really supporting the industry and seeking out the little films and and making an effort to you know um you know share those films or talk about them online or you know things like that um cuz oh it's just so great wherever you go as a scot you know you're always so welcomed and there's always someone who's got a connection and yeah, I would just love them to, uh, I mean, I'm sure they do anyway. I, you know, I don't know people's viewing, but just keeping an eye on, on the, the little stuff that's coming out. Uh, we're still trying to get films. I mean, film studios are gradually kind of growing here. We've got Outlander going on, so there's film studios near there. And But, you know, it's been a long old fight to get proper film studios and that here so any support and that you know those kind of directions would be great because uh, we've just got such a wealth of talent a wealth of locations a wealth of everything and um yeah it's just about nourishing and, and nurturing our like our baby talent as well which is why I like doing short films and stuff as well like they're really important and I think you can tell a really brave story of a short film because there's not the the like budget and people needing money back and things you know what I mean you can get money for a short film and tell really bold and brilliant stories um so yeah there's lots of stuff happening here even if you know, it's not sort of out in the kind of bigger realms. It's wonderful. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, I, uh, I'm I, just looking a little to the future. Um, you know, we just saw you in The Northman, an incredible, incredible film. Um, oh, would I love, love Rob. To- <laughs> I mean, it's it's again a testament that that um, you know that you've appeared in you know two of his films. Uh, you're, I, I'm sure on Wikipedia he, you're now listed as a frequent collaborator, and you'll be you know ticking off every project. Oh, he's along amazing! The way. He's amazing, isn't he? I just love him so much, and he, his films like The Lighthouse. I'm not in The Lighthouse. I wasn't a seagull or anything. I promise. <laughs> I wasn't dressed up in feathers, but oh, he's just such a brilliant filmmaker. And oh, that was a real treat getting to work with him in the North one again and, and being with Anya again and Ralph. And yeah, it was like a wee family reunion. Uh, that was lovely. Yeah. And looking forward, are there any projects on the horizon that you can share or is it all sort of top secret for the moment? Um. So let me think. So I could touch on, I did a couple of projects last year that I think I'd be okay to mention. One is called Raven's Hollow, and it's directed by a director called Christopher Hatton, and it's about Edgar Allan Poe. Um, And another film I did called Worm Eater. Oh, my goodness, this script's wild. Worm Eater by a director called Ben Steiner. And, oh, I can't say, I can't say anything about the plot, but... Yeah, One Meter is wild, and I loved doing it, and I loved Raven's Hollow as well, but One Meter is, that character is like nothing I've ever played before. Um, So there are a couple of projects that are coming out. I'm, I'm excited to excited to see those films. I, I'm so curious what is on those playlists for these new roles. Can't wait to, oh, can't God, wait to find yeah. out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking back to the worm eater one, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm, mm. So the Raven Solo one was quite dark and classical, and Worm Eater character had some, yeah, see, she had some good choices, more contemporary actually. So interesting. Yeah, she's interesting. Okay. That's a good way to tease us. <laughs> Yeah. I love how yeah. we're both trying to figure out what kind of movie this is yeah. based on what you just said. I'm like, oh, is there some ABBA on this playlist? Uh, right. <laughs> or are we going in a very different direction? I say nothing. <laughs> well, we both want a copy of this playlist when you're done with it. So before you yes. get rid of it, you have to send us a copy of this yes, playlist. Yes, I do. I do. I definitely will have still have one meter somewhere, so I must dig it out. 
um yeah yeah oh and actually it. talking about roles if you're talking about roles I'd want to play I was just thinking back I did this short film I don't think it's out in the domain yet but it's maybe just doing film festivals but it's a short film called Lily Sadie and it was about um a woman who lived or she died in 1704 she's one of the last women to be um accused of witchcraft in Scotland and it was based on a true character and um we made a, a, an amazing director called Elise de Trois, and she wrote and directed this short film about Lily Sadie and Lily Sadie was from Fife in Scotland and she's the only woman accused of witchcraft that there's an actual grave of in Scotland so I went to Tory Burn and Fife um, to kind of pay homage to her before I started the film. I wanted to find her, her grave. I thought I'd find a grave. Luckily, I went at low tide because her grave as such is just a slab and it's an intertidal grave, so you don't see it when the tide's in. And they buried her there and put a big slab over her to keep what they said was our wicked spirit from coming back to haunt them. So luckily I went, just drove with my boyfriend. We went to Fife. I was like, I'm going to try and find it. I'd find this news article online. It talked about this thing near a railway bridge near on the beach. I didn't really know what I was looking for. We turned up, luckily the tide was out. I found the railway bridge looking around and then I was like, oh my goodness, it's just this unmarked, massive big slab of stone. And there under there lies Lily Asadi, who I think she was maybe in her 60s when she was tortured. She was tortured for over a month and um, accused of witchcraft um, by actually another woman in the village who'd been drunk and said, I wasn't drunk, it was Lily Asadi that you know, bewitched me and then was tortured for a month and she died in captivity. We don't know if she killed herself or whether she died through the torturing. Uh, and Scotland's now in this kind of process of pardoning, uh, not pardoning, sorry, apologising formally to all the people who were killed for witchcraft. I think nearly 3,000 people in Scotland. Some of them men as well, but mostly women. Um, so just thinking about that, I would. It, it'd be interesting. I'd love to if that was made into a feature. Say, I would love to explore Lilius a lot more, and and really delve into what it was like to live as a woman at a time where you know witchcraft was such. You know, everyone was getting accused of it. You know, anything you did wrong, you could be accused of, of being a witch. And I would find that really interesting to delve in and how hard to be a woman back then, you know, it's hard enough anyway, all the time. But in 1704 with the witchcraft and women just being murdered all the time, um, I would I would really love to explore that in more depth, actually, of really what 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 the reality of living with that you know, fear and, you know, and it even being other women turning on you because they're gossiping or they didn't like you or they were drunk or whatever. So I was just look, looking back. So I was thinking, is there a role that I would really like to play? But I would love to discover her more. Um, she sounded an amazing woman, you know, amazing woman. And she never, she never gave names of any of the other women they tried to extract from her and, she was tortured really heavily. So, yeah, I, I, I find, you know, that, that that would be an interesting thing for me if I was to imagine, you know, like a specific role I wanted mm. to um, explore, I think. Because I honestly, and I, I, I'm not for a minute suggesting that everything's changed, but I feel there's change afoot, like real change. There's accountability happening now. There's people that were really are standing up. And I just had, I just didn't know it would ever change. Like I didn't know. I just thought it would be this constant hamster wheel of teaching young women how to deal with all this and, don't you know, all this list of, like, um, rules we have for young women and now I'm like oh brilliant now we're actually going to look at young men and how they're brought up and instead of saying don't do this don't do this don't do this to all the women we're starting to look at young men and going do this don't do that and 
Oh, I don't know. I just, I find it really exciting. Um, and when you think of where we've come from, from people like Lily and Sadie, um, you know, much hope in our younger generation for everything, for, you know, all the gender things, diversity. I've got a lot of hope for our youth to, you know, be better at being human than we've been. Or, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm talking about generational, not, you know, you two specifically. <laughs> you know, I just mean as humans, I just hope we evolve into, oh, I'm, just, I, I, I'm not going to lose hope that we become better. I just have an eternal hope, no matter all the awful stuff that goes on and the awful people in power and the terrible wars that are, you know, in Ukraine at the moment. And there's so many things that bother me and worry me. Um, but again, relating these, you know, historical stories that you want to tell to, to you know, to today is is part of why, you know, people always ask when you're making a film, why now? And and you've just answered that very question. And clearly that's part of your process. And, and I think, yeah. you know, looking to the future with hope is also, you know, uh, just such a, 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 an optimistic and great way of looking at things, because again... Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes things will get worse. And, uh, you know, through our stories, hopefully we can uh, make things a little better again. Yeah, that's it. If you keep, you know, and that's the thing about telling the difficult stories, isn't it? We're never going to, you know, learn, empathise, understand, move on as a society if, if we're not hearing stories from everyone and all parts of life and all, all life experiences, you know. Um, I'm a big believer in that, you know, things getting out in the public realm is a very good way of society coming to terms with the shit in our life, basically, you know, and how we avoid making the same mistakes because we won't ever stop making the same mistakes if we don't shine a light on the problems, you know. And I, I, I'm really excited at the feeling that the world's kind of going through some kind of which feels to me an awakening and accountability, some kind of seismic shift. I hope, or this is my hope anyway, that that's the way it keeps moving forward. Um, yeah, full of hope. You know, thank you so much for taking the time out today to talk with us. This is uh, really oh, awesome. Thank you for and thank you for your patience. I, mean, I, I spilled the coffee, I dropped the iPad, we had phone calls. It's been busy, but you've been amazing. And thank you for all your patience and me setting up. And yeah, I've just loved chatting to you both. Likewise. Lovely to meet you both. Yeah, thank you yeah. so thank much. You. It was so great to hear all of your insights. <laughs> so oh, thank want... you for letting me chat. Oh, I've loved all the stories. I can't wait to get the coffee table book with your uh, playlist. <laughs> playlist coffee table book. I am there. Well, Kate, thanks so much for taking the time out to speak with us today. It has been an absolute pleasure. Oh, thank you so much for having me and letting me ramble on. And it's been lovely just chatting to you both, really. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the St. Andrews Society of Los Angeles podcast. For more information on the St. Andrews Society of Los Angeles, visit www.standrewsla.org. And don't forget to like our Facebook page, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube channels as well. Have a great week and we'll see you next episode.